Hello and welcome to today's meeting of Democrats of Greater Tucson. Now, it is my distinct pleasure to introduce Secretary of State Katie Hobbs, who is running for governor so she can continue to be a champion for all Arizonans. Katie is a native Arizonan who served in the Arizona House for two years and then in the Arizona Senate for six years, where she was the Senate Minority Leader. She was elected as Secretary of State in 2018, and among her accomplishments, and there are a lot of them, are passing Medicaid expansion in Arizona through a bipartisan effort, securing the rights of victims of sexual and domestic violence, providing new opportunities for education and job training, defending Arizonans' rights, voting rights, and combating disinformation, and running the most secure election in the state's history in 2020 amid unprecedented challenges to our democracy. And with that, Katie, the floor is yours. Thank you so much for having me. Good afternoon, Democrats of Greater Tucson. I'm so thrilled to be with all of you and grateful for this opportunity. I want to talk a little bit about the 2020 election because it seems like we're still in the midst of it, <laughs> for some folks anyway. And then we'll, we'll talk about my campaign for governor and happy to take questions if there's time for that. What I can't say enough is that every Arizonan, I don't care if you voted for Biden or voted for Trump or anyone else, you can be confident in all three elections that we ran in 2020. They were secure, they were fair, and the results we certified are accurate. Everything you see to the contrary really is just made up. People talking about Sharpies or I, whatever. I don't. I can't even keep track of all bamboo fibers in ballots. I, I can't keep keep track of all the conspiracy theories. It seems like every day out of this fake audit in Maricopa County, there's new lies being spread, and they're just there's no basis for any of them. So I I just wanted to highlight a tool that we created for the 2020 election and is still available. One of the things that we did that helped ensure the success of the election, and really that was about ensuring voters were able to participate and participate safely, we invested significant resources in public education and, and information and to push back on the disinformation that was so rampant and still continues. And so Arizona.vote is part of that effort, and it's a comprehensive information about how voters could participate. But after the election, we set up a MythBuster section of that website. If you hear some of the misinformation coming out, you can go to the MythBuster website. There's also a series of videos we put together. Arizona.vote is a pretty good resource that's going to be a, continue to be available. That being said, I, I want to give a quick quick update about the, the fraud it going on in Maricopa County. And I didn't coin that word, but somebody did. And then we started widely using it. And now everybody is using the word fraud it. So I am proud of that word <laughs> um, because this is not a real audit. What we've been working hard to do is really highlight the problems that are going on and taking place with this exercise and all the things that make it not a real audit. The first and foremost is that any chance to bring any evidence forward, problems or fraud or anything that would have had an impact on the actual results of the election has long passed. There were nine court challenges brought in Arizona. There was no evidence to support any of them. And we certified the election on November 30th, and we are well past any opportunity legal or otherwise to overturn any election results. But there also is zero basis to do so. So this fraud it, the ultimate goal is to continue to sow doubt, to undermine voters' confidence in the systems, our election and the election integrity. Sometimes I think to personally attack me and my integrity or that of other election officials, and also um, you know, lay the groundwork to steal a future election. And I think I heard someone chatting about this 
leading up before the meeting kicked off, but also potentially incite another insurrection on the government. There's a couple other places where you can find information, detailed information about the audit. I don't want to belabor all the problems, but we um, on our website put together a list of We've had independent election observers go in and writing their observations. And so we've been keeping a detailed log of that. We are going to be coming out with a report um, in the next couple of weeks that encapsulates all of that. And we're, we're really looking at that report as like a pre report to say, look, no matter what they come up with, this isn't a real audit. Their results aren't get, aren't can't be credible, and here's why. Um, that'll be coming out in the next couple of weeks, and that'll also be available on our website. It's and the website is azsos.gov. And I'm sure that when we put that report out, it'll be highlighted in all of our social media, so you can easily find it. And then um, we've been working with a couple different groups, and so there's a couple reports that are available about this audit. Reports by election experts that debunk this whole thing. And just know that no matter what, the intent has never been to validate the election results. The intent has been to find fraud, non-existent fraud, and make it up if they can't. And one of the things that is interesting is that we're really starting to see a lot of the wheels come off the bus here with the with the process, which was never a good process to begin with. Michelle Eugenti Rita, who has been a champion of voter suppression in the legislature, and she authored the bill that got rid of the permanent early voter list and is running for secretary of state and got booed off the stage at the Trump rally on Saturday. And, and formed a new country that's and has subsequently taken to Twitter to say this audit is botched because of Karen Fan's bad leadership and I don't support it anymore. And now the audit liaison, Ken Bennett, who is the former Secretary of State, former Senate President, he was shut out of the audit on Friday and did an interview this morning where he said he's on the verge of resigning because they're deliberately cutting him out of things. I don't have a lot of love for Ken Bennett, but I do think he did step into this for the right reasons. He was trying to provide some semblance of integrity to the process as the former Secretary of State. He never succeeded in doing that. And now because he's like trying to do that, they're shutting him out altogether because I don't think he's, he is not willing to let them go public and say, oh, here's all this fraud that we know wasn't there. And so so I, the wheels are starting to come off of this. I do think, though, that they intend to keep dragging it out as long as possible because they are making money off of it. And the, they is, I don't know, it's Trump's allies, the pillow guy, Pulitzer, Doug Logan, who's the head of the Cyber Ninjas, who is running this thing. Jovan Pulitzer was here last week in Phoenix for the hearing that wasn't really a hearing that the Senate held about the audit and got on a private plane and did a Facebook Live from the private plane when he was flying back to wherever he came from and said that they've raised $9 million. So these private fundraising efforts to raise money for this which we don't know where the money's coming from or who's, you know, who it's going to, $9 million. This is grift. And these people are being misled and taken advantage of to support this effort that is never going to do anything to overturn the election or otherwise, it's just going to incite more problems. We've been focused in my office on the lack of ability to actually stop it from continuing. We've been doing everything we can to debunk everything that's coming out of it so that the majority of Arizona voters and American voters for that matter will know that this is nothing more than a grift and a sham, um, which I think, you know, for the most part, people are aware of. And honestly, the folks who believe in this are just being misled for one person's ego and agenda, which is, I, I know you all are as horrified about this as I am. So anyway, I will move on from that and talk a little bit about my campaign. And again, really appreciate the um, opportunity. And I know that I've, I've been around a while, I've spoken to you before. So I know that you know, a little bit about me, I just want to 
kind of talk about where I came from and and how I got here. My, my entire life, I've been someone who works to help others really because of how I was raised. Growing up, my parents always worked hard to make sure that we could succeed. And there were times we struggled, times where we relied on food stamps to get by, but we always made it thanks to the hard work of my parents and the generosity of uh, our church community. I wanted to give back to my community. That was something that was always instilled in me. And so I became a social worker. Working at a domestic violence shelter, I saw firsthand how our broken politics often derails any real action and makes real change harder. But I also learned how to break through that partisan gridlock and do some really good things for Arizonans. Eventually ran for office because I was tired of politicians who cared more about their reelection than serving their community. Once I got to state government, I took on issues that had been ignored for too long. And you heard about them briefly in my intro, but I worked to protect survivors of domestic abuse and, and cleared the backlog of untested rape kits with Republican support, specifically Governor Ducey. I expanded Medicaid with Governor Brewer and worked with Governor Ducey to pass historic legislation to fight the op opioid epidemic head on. While I was in the legislature, in the state house and state senate and eventually as minority as senate minority leader we fought hard to improve our economy and protect our way of life and our state has grown uh, in, in impressive ways in the past few decades when i became secretary of state i wanted to continue that hard work for arizona my predecessor had horrifically mismanaged the office entering into expensive contracts and misusing taxpayer resources so I came in and streamlined our operations, made the office more efficient and accountable to Arizonans. And I worked to conduct the most successful election I possibly could. I had no way of knowing back in 2019, the roadblocks that we would face in this effort, a global pandemic, unprecedented attacks on the validity of our election, and even violent threats against me, my family and my staff. But here's the thing that you need to know about me. I have never backed down when things get tough. No matter the challenge, I will always stand up for what's right. That's what I've been doing in defending the results of the election from conspiracy theories and misinformation. I've stood up to the so-called audit in Maricopa County, even though it's resulted in more ugly vitriol. These last several months have been incredibly revealing. The truth is that our state government is being run by a group of conspiracy theorists that is out of touch with everyday Arizonans. Instead of working on the issues that matter most to the people, they are busy relitigating the 2020 election because they don't like the result. I'm running for governor to get back to work for Arizona, to deliver accountability, transparency, and results for Arizonans. We have a massive opportunity ahead of us. We can make Arizona the best state in the country to live, work, and raise a family. But we can only do that if we put our differences aside and start working on the issues that we keep ignoring. We need to fully fund our public schools so that every child can get a quality education. We have to increase our efforts to recruit and retain the best teachers for our children. We need to fix our infrastructure so we can keep bringing business to our state from all over the world. We need smart economic development that pos positions the Arizona communities to attract investments and create good jobs. We need to invest in tomorrow's workforce through our university system, two-year colleges, and technical education so that Arizonans are getting the rewards of the great jobs available in Arizona. We need to resolve major questions around water and land use now so we can keep growing our state in a sustainable way. We need to improve healthcare access and delivery, especially in rural parts of the state, and we must care for our seniors. We need to fight climate change and forest fires. If we don't fund these efforts now, it will be far more expensive and difficult down the road. And of course, we must protect voting rights, which are fundamental to our democracy. I believe government can work for us and for our families but only when our leaders are focused on getting things done together rather than looking to score political points. You can always count on me to stand up and do what's right, no matter the challenge or the political obstacles standing in my way. 
It's what I've done my whole career. My campaign has gotten off to a really incredible start. We've raised more than than a million dollars so far this year and nearly a dozen state legislators and three major labor unions have already endorsed my campaign and I'm just getting started. Meanwhile, the Republican primary is a circus with five candidates and counting who are all trying to be the most Trumpy option. I think we have a real opportunity to win this race and get our state back on track. And of course, I'd love to have your support to do it. Uh, you can join our campaign at kdhobbs.org. There's um, the ability to donate there, to sign up as a volunteer, and also a link to sign my petition to help me get on the ballot if you haven't had a chance to do that already. We have sent actual paper petitions uh, down to Pima County, and if we haven't, we certainly will, so that if you want to sign or circulate paper petitions, those are available as well. Thank you again so much for having me, and if there's time for questions, I would love to take some. Absolutely, Katie. Thank you so much for everything that you've done, and I can speak on behalf of Democrats of Greater Tucson and say we've got your back. We, you know, we admire what you do and and we're going to support you. Uh, And I wanted to ask you, Katie, the Supreme Court ruled recently that Arizona is allowed to keep its laws against ballot collection. They call it ballot harvesting. And also a law that says if you vote in the wrong precinct, your vote doesn't count. What, What options are available to get these laws struck down and put us on a path of not voter suppression, but, you know, voting rights? Well, we can elect Democratic majorities who would work to overturn these laws. That's number one. Number two, these are laws that have been on the books for a while. I mean, while I'm disappointed in the outcome, the overall impact is the status quo here in Arizona. I'm much more concerned about the impact that this ruling is going to have nationally because it really narrows the ability for folks to bring voting rights challenges to the courts based on discrimination. And we're seeing just such an unprecedented number of laws enacted across the country that really restrict access to voting, including here in Arizona. And so um, the the biggest impact is really limiting that ability to to use the courts to challenge, um, which, you know, the Supreme Court over the last several years has continued to erode the Voting Rights Act, starting with Section 5 and Shelby v. Holder. This is just another attack there. And so ultimately, federal legislation that strengthens the Voting Rights Act, such as the John Lewis Voting Rights Act and the For the People Act, would go a long way to help to help push back against this rash of voter suppressive laws that we're seeing and ensure that Arizonans and Americans have equal access to the ballot, no matter who holds the majority in their legislatures. All right. Thank you very much, Katie. We have a question from Tamara Birch. Uh, Tamara, please unmute yourself and ask your question. Thank you. I'm calling from Cochise County. Um, I'm a strong Democrat and adore Katie. Uh, As far as I know, the county party office, nor myself and Bisbee, do not have paper ballots. And then I wanted to know the online address for I can uh, um, educate people about that too. And then my question is, do I have to sign up and register to be a circulator circulator of the petitions? So I'm going to take your last question first. Okay. For, For candidates, no, you don't have to sign up to be a petition circulator. There are registration requirements for initiatives and I, they most likely apply to referendum as well, but perhaps someone leading the charge on the referendum efforts could answer this um, more specifically. Uh, And I I think it applies to paid circulators or out of state circulators. So I think um, if you're an Arizona voter, uh, you can circulate a petition. You just have to make sure you mark it um, volunteer or paid. Um, And then that, and again, that applies to referendum and initiative petitions those petitions um, are scrutinized much more closely than candidate petitions. They're subject to strict compliance rather than uh, uh, substantial compliance. Um, so it's a higher standard. Um, uh, we can get you some 
petitions. If you, so Elena's on this meeting and I'll throw her email in the chat. It's Elena at katiehobbs.org. The, the link to sign the petition electronically is on my website. Folks can also just go to the Arizona Secretary of State's website and look for EQUAL. EQUAL is the electronic signature portal. You can also give candidates who are running with clean elections. There are $5 contributions there as well. Did that, I'm sorry if you had other questions. I think that answered all your questions. Let's turn to Dr. Barbara Warren, a member of DGT who has a question. Go ahead, Dr. Warren. Hi, Katie. As a physician, I'd like to ask you two questions if I could. The first one is, this pandemic is no way over and it's and the virus is showing us its skill and changing and and evolving and it could go on for a very long time very unfortunately so i'm wondering well, how you might have or would as governor handle the situation of the pandemic differently the other question i have is it's hotter than ever it's been a really hot summer and we know globally, locally, nationally, locally, that climate change is advancing. So how do you plan to address mm-hmm. climate climate change very aggressively as a governor? Um, thank you for those questions. First of all, I can't tell you how often I sat in my office with my team who were trying to successfully make sure that Arizonans could vote in the face of this pandemic and vote safely um, and that it didn't compromise anyone's ability to participate. and how many times I said, God, he's missing so many opportunities, he being the current governor, I would have done this so much differently. And starting with the fact that Arizona has a pandemic response plan, and I'm sure that it's sitting in a binder on a shelf somewhere, and it never came down. Early on, the woman who was at DEMA, the emergency management face of this pandemic and vote safely, and she left early on because her job was to oversee the the response and coordinate the response. And she wasn't allowed to do her job. She was told to be a mouthpiece and she decided she didn't want to do that. To be fair, the federal government obviously had a huge role that they missed. And a lot of governors were behind in response because they were waiting for the federal government's response and especially Republican governors, which unfortunately created so much partisanship over the whole entire situation that didn't need to be there. But I think to some degree, the Republican governors especially were worried about losing needed resources for their state if they spoke out against the way that Trump was handling things and they were taking their direction from him and that put us in such a bad space. How Ducey handled it was failing to own it as an Arizona problem and failing to lead us through it despite the bumbling of the federal government's response. And I think he missed an opportunity to invoke a sense of shared sacrifice and say, we're all in this together and we will get through this together. And I know that those are just words, but you are the governor and you have a bully pulpit and a way to bring people together that most people don't have the chance to do. And he failed on all of those accounts. And and I don't know that that would have put us in a different position. There were so many points during the pandemic in Arizona that everyone that I talked to was like, yeah, we're just, it's all, we're all on our own. Like there's no, like go to the store at your own peril or do whatever. Where we are right now, I think the governor is perfectly happy to have just like, He's put it in the rear view mirror Um, by his account. It's over and we're moving forward. And he was willing to sacrifice that the 17,000 Arizona lives to not invoke further restrictions or shutdowns because now he can run for president saying the economy in Arizona is very strong, even though. Uh, People who shouldn't be getting evicted are getting evicted. He's sitting on a pile of eviction prevention specific dollars that aren't being utilized to keep people in their homes. And as well as other money that should have gone to small businesses to help them weather this storm. And so there was no sense of we're all in this together and we're going to help you get through it because he didn't give the resources that were available. And there's still, he's still sitting on a pile of, of, federal COVID dollars that haven't been distributed. Um, And then when he said over and over and over again that we're following the science, he is not following the science. He is, he signed legislation that, that 
disallows school districts from imposing mask mandates to keep their students and their families safe. And so schools are starting and the kids under 12 can't be vaccinated and they are at risk. And he's not letting school districts manage their communities to make things as safe as possible. Um, and I could go on and on and on, but those are just the highlights of the failures <laughs> as I see them. And, you know, I think that the bottom line um, in, a, in any crisis, a pandemic, whatever, you have to rely on the experts. As the governor, I have no sense that I have all the answers, but how I've been successful in all of the positions I've held, whether in the private sector or in government, is that I rely on, I bring people around me that I can trust and that know how to find the answers if we don't have them. And we have focused on building partnerships and as governor, those partnerships would be broader and more critical in managing the, the many issues that we face in the state. And, um, you know, you have the, the largest hospitals in the state begging for mask requirements and the governor won't, won't listen to them. I mean, I don't, I, 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 I'm sure I'm not saying anything that you all haven't thought, but, but I would have definitely managed this whole situation very differently. In regards to climate change, First of all, I know that, you know, Arizona could do a lot more than we're doing, and it is not going to necessarily fix climate change in Arizona, but certainly we are not doing our part right now to address the global issue of climate change. Uh, the governor has been happy to do the bare minimum in terms of meeting any federal standards and requirements. Um, and we could be doing so much more. We are well positioned to be a leader in renewable energy uh, particularly solar, and the big utilities have been able to really shut that down um, to be as 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 big as it could be in Arizona. We should be the solar capital of at least America, if not the world, um, with the amount of sunshine. Uh, and I know it's raining right now, but um, and and also um, you know join uh, efforts like the Paris Climate Accord, which I know a lot of local jurisdictions have signed on to, but Arizona as a whole has not. Um, and really, you know, do our part as a team player. And this is, Arizona is going to bear the brunt, uh, a, a large part of the brunt of climate change. And we're already seeing it in record high temperatures, record high low temperatures, if that made sense. Um, we are uh, the experts are talking about no longer having a wildfire season. There's just wildfires and those impact so much. So there's so much to do. I think that we've just ignored so many problems for so long because they're hard and you sometimes have to make tough choices and get people to do things they don't want to do. But that's leadership. It is not leadership to just say, I'm going to do this, put this small band-aid on this problem and kick the can down the road for the next person to, to deal with the big impact of it. Um, we need people who are willing to tackle tough issues, even if it's not necessarily popular. And that's, that's the leadership that I'll bring to the governor's office. Thanks very much, Katie. We have a question from Carol Gar. Carol, you're unmuted. Go ahead and ask your question. Hey, Katie. I'm going to ask something on a totally different topic. I just read in the paper about a judge throwing out the arrangement between the Department of Corrections and the state of Arizona regarding their inadequate health care for the inmates. I was wondering if you have any idea of how to approach that to fix the problem. We have failed on so many regards in terms of the shutting down prison reform and criminal justice reform because the powers of be don't want to move that forward. And it same with how we treat our inmates when it comes to things that they have a right to, such as humanitarian treatment and healthcare. Changing that starts with the conversation about how we regard the people that are in our correctional facilities. And, you know, I think there's a sense right now that they're not entitled to the humanitarian treatment. At least that's what one would sense from looking at how they're treated. Um, and the healthcare um, issue, which has been ongoing for a long time and is costing our state millions of dollars, our taxpayers millions of dollars, um, is just not, um, it, it's not being addressed. And it's not gonna go away. 
And I think the the recent ruling um, indicates that the the courts are not satisfied with what's been done or what hasn't been done, and that that um, we're going to have to. I mean, th this con it part of it is the con the 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 vendor that holds the contract, and they've mi they, they, they've misperformed or underperformed or haven't done what they're supposed to do, and the state renewed their contract. I mean, this is. It's 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 a system of cronyism, a system of rewarding uh, people that are not doing what they're supposed to do. And again, I think this is indicative of of the kind of leadership that we've had at our state for a long time, and it needs to change. We have a question from Jackie Romer. Go right ahead, Jackie. I'm concerned about our private information on our ballots being cultivated and being saved by this group of people, just as the 4,500 tips to the FBI um, on Kavanaugh are, were sent directly to Trump. And considering his very vindictive nature and the fact that he threatened to corral all the high social media profile people years ago, I, I want a specific answer whether or not anyone in the state of Arizona knows if our private information is being saved because I mean, it's just assumed that it's, if it is being saved, it's going to be vulnerable. Mm -hmm. So do you have an answer for that? I want to assure everybody that your ballot is a secret ballot and there's no identifying information about any voter that is attached to their ballot. Maricopa County turned over ter terabytes of data to the Senate to try to satisfy their subpoena. And there is personally identifying information that is contained in the voter database, and that is protected. It's not like these crazy contractors have your social security number or your date of birth. I think folks are rightfully concerned about the security and privacy of everything that has been turned over because these folks are just experimenting with it. And they, you know, they, they took hard drives with a bunch of data to a cab, a, a lab get that was traced to a cabin in Montana. I don't know what that lab is doing with that data or specifically what data it is. And so folks are rightfully concerned. I do want to assure you that your personally identifying information that's a part of your voter registration record, those things are protected and they're not able to be released. It's like why when you're when you're knocking on doors and you have the voter file in front of you, it doesn't have people's birthdays on it. It has it, it says like one one zero zero or one one of whatever year it is. It doesn't have people's real birthdays because that's information that's not able to be given to the public. In this situation, that kind of information also wasn't provided. Thanks very much. We have a question from D. Maitland. This is a little bit odd, Katie, but have you worked with uh, Christian Cinema while you were in the legislature? I did. Um, in fact, when I first got involved in politics, my first election that I did any volunteer campaigning for was the 2004 election. And that was when Kirsten Cinema, who was elected to the House in my district, was elected. And I did a significant amount of door knocking for her to help her win that race. I followed her into that House seat and then followed her into the state Senate seat. She's someone that I have considered a mentor in politics. That being said, I have not spoken to her recently regarding anything, including the For the People Act or the filibuster or anything else. I've made my positions very clear. Uh, my staff has certainly reached out and had conversations with her staff about what they're doing on the For the, For the People Act. I don't have satisfactory answers on that. And that's all I want to say about that. <laughs> I was hoping you could do something. Thank you. Question again from Tamara Birch in Cochise County. Go ahead. So the U.S. Post Office and uh, DeJoy, I felt like, you know, he was disastrous. So can we influence Biden or can you or I mean, I, I sign petitions all the time. I don't mm -hmm. see how we're getting rid of him. It's my understanding that DeJoy is in his position because of a board of governors of some mm -hmm. sort. And this is the bureaucracy of the postal service that I don't necessarily understand. I don't think Biden can directly terminate his position. And I think despite the 
massive amounts of misinformation and attacks that were launched at the Postal Service leading into the 2020 election as one of the pieces of information that we pushed back on a great deal, made sure that Arizona voters had the information they needed. We made sure that we were putting out a lot more um, secure ballot drop boxes so people had alternatives to the mail. But we also reached out directly to the Postal Service in Arizona and worked with them to ensure that ballot delivery was not going to be interrupted or impacted or anything else. And we worked with the counties to set up systems where they could go directly to the post office to pick up ballots instead of waiting for them to be delivered. And a lot of other things that really helped make sure that mail-in ballots were delivered on time. And, and that helped us to establish relationships. There's a continued open door to talking about that, to talking with them. And we'll certainly re-engage as we head into the 2022 election to make sure that the same kinds of things are happening to ensure that ballot delivery is both in both directions is not interrupted in any way. Although I don't anticipate that the Biden administration would do that. We just want to make sure that things are working the way they're supposed to. Um, the five-day curing period for the provisionals, is that gone? Oh, no, 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 no. The Yay. only thing the only thing that's gone, and it and to be honest with you, it was never actually in statute, is the is the five day post election cure period for a ballot that is missing a signature. So right now, if you have a provisional ballot five days after election to cure, um, if there's and not not every provisional ballot needs to be cured. Um, uh, so, but if there's, if there's an onus on the voter to go back and fix whatever issue is with the ballot, it's five days post-election and five days post-election for missed matched signatures on a, on a mail-in ballot. So the only thing that we don't have is a five day post-election cure period for missing signatures that was never in statute to begin with. Now it's explicitly excluded from statute. Um, and this, as you know, I'm sure disproportionately impacts our Native American communities. The ballot directions are not written in any Native American language. And so they're more likely to miss the signature on the envelope of their ballot on the, on the affidavit. And if they're dropping off a ballot on election day, they're not going to have the opportunity because the, 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 they don't, the counties don't get those ballots until, you know, when the polls close on election day. But there is, uh, if they are turning in ballots early and they're missing a signature, they're able to be cured up to the time of polls closing on election day. Okay, we have a question from our member, Shirley Muni. Go ahead, Shirley. Um, hi, Katie. Um, Arizona doesn't have a lieutenant governor. Uh, we've never had that position. We've tried before to establish it. Right now, the second in command, if the governor resigns or, or is incapacitated, uh, would be the secretary of state, which means we'd have to have a new secretary of state who might not be prepared. How do you feel about the position of lieutenant governor being added? To well, I don't, it does, uh, that's a good question. It doesn't necessarily matter how I feel about it because this is the way that our constitution was written and constitutional changes re require a vote of Arizonans. And so it's sure. been, the, the Lieutenant Governor position has been referred to the ballot twice and voted down by voters twice. I think in general, it would create an additional administrative office that's not really necessary. The way that we have it set up in Arizona where we're separately elected and potentially different parties, it's how Rose Mofford took over from really horrible Governor Evan Meekum. It's up to the voters and they've they've um, rejected it twice. So Senator Mesnar continues to try to push it to the ballot, but so far he hasn't been successful. Okay, Bridget Rashashi has a question. Go ahead, Bridget. I have a question regarding the decision by the judge that was in the newspaper today regarding Brinovich's position that Arizona could use pandemic dollars to support tax cuts. The judge ruled against his position. Can you describe the next steps about what might happen in Arizona related to that? And I saw the same thing you did. Um, I probably outlined what needed to happen. 
but I don't know, I don't know the impact of what will happen. Well, then let me uh, ask Katie to wrap up this meeting. Tell us how we can support you. What can we do to find out information about you? Well, thank you again so much for having me. Just, you can go to katiehabs.org, sign up to volunteer, donate if you can, sign my petition to get on the ballot. And if you want, um, I'm, I'm happy to come speak at other meetings. I'd love to do that. And Elena can get you, get me set up to do that. So, and it's Elena at katiehabs.org. And Elena is A L. A-I-N-A. All right, Katie, speaking on behalf of the members of Democrats of Greater Tucson, we're so appreciative that you came and spoke to us today. We want to wish you all the best in the campaign. And with that, we're going to conclude the meeting. So I hope to see a lot of you at the happy hour, which is coming up on Tuesday night. Thanks for coming. Thanks.